So over the course of certainly this morning, Ken, Lisa and Peter have been describing to you the successful experiments and implementations that they've led and put in place. And I like to think of them as if you like high quality components that have yet to be assembled. You know, they've taken place in different parts of organisations, but they've yet to be assembled in one place. Imagine how good that could be if you did. Now, in the workbook, Making Hospitals Work, that's exactly what Mark and I've done. We've taken all these high quality components, other successful experiments that we've run, and best practices that we've seen, and assembled them all in one place. Middleton General Hospital, a fictional hospital. And it, it goes on to describe a seemingly um, utopian future state and a means to get in there to yield the results you saw before Mark showed you these. So take a few minutes again just to look at the, the power of that. Now I know what you're thinking, and I don't blame you. So what I'd, I'd like to do now is actually take you for a walk through Middleton General Hospital. So I'm going to try and articulate to you what it would look like as you actually walk through this hospital. So as you approach ED, you notice there are only two ambulances parked outside, and one of those is about to pull off. As you walk into Majors, you notice that the atmosphere is calm and disciplined. There's not a queue in a corridor at all. But you do notice, located adjacent to ED, you see a small multidisciplinary team treating patients. And what you notice, and, and you've seen this slide before, but what you notice is that as one member of staff completes the work that they need to do for the patient, they hand them immediately on to the next patient without delay. So it's, again, it's a bit like at the top there, you know, you see the old westerns where they've got a chain of people putting out a fire in a barn. Everyone knows exactly what to do. Now this team's led by a senior decision maker and everybody knows exactly what their job is and what they have to do. Located close to this multidisciplinary uh, team, which by the way, the team is actually located by ED because 84% of patients in ED require an x-ray in majors. So located nearby, you see a number of empty trolleys. Now it turns out these, the quantity of these empty trolleys has been carefully calculated to cope with sudden surges in demand and variation around those surges in demand. It's also useful to understand that there's also a, a carefully calculated, well-known and well-rehearsed routine for when certain numbers of these spaces are occupied, an escalation process. So for example, if two, are complete, uh, two spaces are full, low level, if the next two, yellow, medium level, if it's red, it's almost like an internal major incident. It's that serious, but it's very, very visual. The team are actually pleased to tell you that they've not failed to meet their four hour, the national four hour target for over 12 months. And they know this because they've got a dashboard. Just a board really, but it's got a number of charts and it's actually displaying. They know what their performance is every day. They go on to explain that not only have they changed the way that they work quite radically, but they're always, they've carefully calculated the number of staff they require for every hour of the day, and they're always fully staffed. Even more importantly, they go on to explain, is that should a patient require admission from ED further into the hospital to MAU, there's always a space available for them. So you're intrigued now, you want to move on to MAU to see how this has actually been achieved. But first you want to take a look at this dashboard, what, what does it feature? And I actually tried to put a slide about this, but it's trying to shrink Excel into PowerPoint struggle. But we really have these. And it measures things like staff morale, patient incidents, patient complaints, target and budget adherence. So the team know exactly how they're doing all the time. So now intrigued, you walk on into MAU. Again, you notice that there's a calm, disciplined atmosphere. Everyone knows what to do. You see another area containing empty trolleys, a buffer, they call it in Middleton. Again, with a carefully calculated escalation process when certain numbers of these trolleys are occupied. 
you see another multidisciplinary team working in exactly the same way that you saw in ED. And you see the now familiar dashboard showing these impressive results yet again. You ask a member of staff in MAU, how did you achieve these significant results over time again? And they say, well, basically, we've changed the way we work. We've care carefully calculated our staffing levels for every hour of the day. But importantly, should a patient require admission further downstream onto a ward, there are always spaces available for them. Pigs fed, ready to fly. So now you're really intrigued. You walk onto a respiratory ward and you, you now witness the now familiar calm, disciplined atmosphere. You see the now familiar empty spaces, buffers. You see the now familiar dashboard. You meet with the ward manager, who is actually now supernumerary. So she can actually manage the ward, she's not part of the numbers. And you ask her, how did you achieve these fantastic results? Firstly, she draws you the fishbone icon. She sketches it out for you. So she explains that that represents the patient's stay on the ward, and there are the support services that the ward staff and the patients actually need during their stay. Importantly, each of those services at the end of the fishbone have carefully, again, carefully calculated what their demand is. Every hour of the day, they're staffed appropriately, so they respond in a required time frame. Really important. So now, the ward staff only have to send a clear, unambiguous signal that they require the support services intervention and they respond within the required time frame. Now, the ward staff know when to send this clear and ambiguous signal because, as Ken showed earlier, they have a plan for every patient. So you see that from the time the patient arrives, or within hours of the patient arriving, the plan is drawn up right through to their projected discharge, which you see is a triangle. So if you like, that's the individual fishbone for every patient as opposed to that genetic one that I've just shown you. You also find out that this ward manager attends and reports several times a day at what they call the visual hospital. It's just a board, really, she explains. But it actually, using simple symbols, very simple symbols, shows the status for every patient in medicine, every single patient in medicine, whether they're not medically fit, not medically fit, but on a wrong, in a wrong bed, on a wrong ward, outliers, off template, whatever you call it whether they're medically fit, in which case they should be discharged, or whether they're medically fit but something's stopping them being discharged. But you can see it. She goes on to explain to you, the ward manager explains, that they've now hired someone called the Master Patient Scheduler. Now, it's this person, the Master Patient Scheduler, their job, if you like, behind the scenes is to keep a continual eye on demand to get into the hospital, variation around that, but really importantly, demand to get out of hospital. It's also this person's job, based on this demand and the variation around demand, to size, to calculate and resize the buffers. This master patient schedule also convinced them that previously at Middleton, they discharged all the patients in a big batch, oh, I don't know, around about late afternoon, early evening, so no one could cope or 2 before 9.30, but if you drip feed them through the day, you'll always have space for incoming patients, at least. You ask the ward manager, can this master patient scheduler make all these decisions and change all this on their own? She replies, no, no, actually no. Firstly, the master patient scheduler has to consult with the Valley Street manager. Now, the value stream manager, it turns out, speaking to the ward manager, is the person who was responsible for implementing everything that you've seen through this walk so far. And they're now the, if you like, the patient representative for medical patients. They're the person responsible to make sure that every medical patient gets what they require on time and in full. And if there's a blockage 
So these medical patients get what they require on time in full. It's their job to resolve at a high level with their peers or going higher if necessary to remove these roadblocks. So you meet with this Valley Street manager and after some time you're in about how difficult it was to convince people this was the right thing to do, how she had to cut across all these different functional silos, how she had to adopt the scientific approach because the approach she's adopted is really the same as evidence-based medicine. They've just done that to fix their own broken system. So Mark took you to the left-hand side. This person would have been involved right at the onset, but their main responsibility then is the plan. Actually planning what we're going to do, how are we going to do it, who's going to do it, when is it going to be done. This Valley Street manager goes on to describe their biggest problem. They got to their biggest problem, it was medical length of stay. Had a hugely adverse impact on hospital acquired infections because obviously the longer you stay in hospital, the greater the chance of picking up an infection. Huge impact on elective uh, capacity because the elective beds were full of medical patients. The ED target was suffering because there was nowhere for ED patients to move on to and cost. So they set themselves a target initially of reducing length of stay by about 50%. And they realised that the cost benefit of doing that, and you can figure it out for yourselves, would be huge. So, as I described, this is a fictional hospital where we've taken these components, <coughs> high quality components, and bolted them all together. But we've actually, and it's a real shame that Khalid isn't here today. And I'll give you a bit of background. We've got a bit of time because Khalid hasn't been here. But Khalid came to Gwent, Royal Gwent, from Bridge End, where he'd been developing, he called it RATS, Rapid Assessment, um, in majors. So he brought that to Gwent, which was fantastic. And he implemented it in Gwent. And they called it RATS, Gwent. But whilst he was in Gwent, he spent a lot of time with the team. He seemed to be like a process engineer in his, in his mind and he spent lots and lots of time with us. Unfortunately, he was lured away then to Prince Charles Hospital in Mid Glamorgan and we lost a bit of touch. And then he rang us up and he said, guys, guys, I'm, I'm going to run an experiment. And uh, it's okay, okay. So we went up to take a look at what he'd actually done. And I'm not going to use Khalid's slides because there are many of them and it wouldn't be fair for me to even try and talk to them. But what he'd actually done whilst he was in Gwent, and we, were, we didn't know he was doing this actually, he'd all, he took to Mid Glam, Prince Charles, he took the ED cell, but he also put in place an MAU, MAU cell, MAU buffer, discharge range buffer, plan for every patient on the medical wards and a visual hospital with bed management people. Just for the week, the perfect week. Their ED performance was fairly chronic, leading up this perfect week, and they had seven days of 100%. And this was the most powerful slide that I could pick out of Khalid's presentation. And you can see there, available medical beds, so going from the left to the right each day of the week. It's huge. So what Khalid did is he took these components, even though we, knew, we weren't sure he was doing it at the time, and he actually did assemble them in one place. But unfortunately, he's now gone to Qatar to do the same thing. Now, I guess the important thing is that Khalid was solving his own problems. He was identifying the problems and solving them himself. But he had to break these paradigms and mental models to get this in place, things we've been trying to do. So I'd like to take you through just a few mental models, paradigms and observations that we've encountered in really four years of working in healthcare that may oppose this seemingly utopian future state. The first one is, how often do you hear the expression, oh, say for example, suddenly a few medical beds become available. How often do you hear, oh, we're going to go and pull some patients from MAU? 
Now, from the patient's perspective, that's like saying, well, we'll take you in now, we're good and ready to accept you. So from the patient's perspective, that's actually push. It ain't pull. Why don't we know demand to get out of hospital? We know the demand to get in usually. Might not be that timely, the information, but we very rarely actually know demand to get out. You can't see it. Taking the foot off the gas, Mark mentioned it earlier. How often do you see when things slow down, so admissions are slowing down, it's getting quieter, people take their foot off the gas, there's no pressure to discharge, even though there is demand to get out. Then suddenly, sudden influx at the front end, need an admission, the whole thing backs up. Why do we allow that? It's really hard to get out of hospital. This slide, we're trying to, it's a little like Lisa's, it shows the various departments and, and it shows a, a weekend and two weekdays. So, I mean, on a Sunday, the patient's screwed. You know, they, there's little chance of the, them getting discharged on Sunday. But when you look, there's a, a narrow band of alignment on a Monday and a Tuesday, but the opportunities are very small. Now, it's, it's, ward, it's ward sisters. It's nurses on the wards who actually discharge patients really physically, right? But let's look at uh, their opportunity to do that. This is a typical day on a ward. So you see, the red are things where they're absolutely not available to discharge. Handover, drug rounds, protected meal breaks now. The yellow's where there's limited availability because they're covering each other's breaks. Some have gone off on a ward round, some have not right in TTOs, etc. And the green is when they're actually fully available to discharge and look where it is. Which is where we get that big batch. Another mental model, why do we think an empty bed is a bad thing? Why do we snatch it, close, close that ward, it's empty? When we know intuitively that these buffers are, are important, that we need them. Very interesting one, this confusion between pathways and a valley stream. Now a pathway, as far as I'm aware, describes what we actually do to the patient. It's not what the patient experiences. A pathway doesn't have written on it, lie on a, a trolley in a corridor for four hours, does it? No. A valley stream describes the patient's experience, so there is an important distinction but they get confused quite widely. Okay. Moving on to management. Being kind, this is people's work in any industry, really. So the value add, real value add, 5%. You've got necessary but non-value added work, so it could be checking someone else's work. You know, the patient might not be happy you're doing it, but it's necessary for now, but really it's non-value add. And then 60% is non-value add completely waste, pure waste. Why don't we start there? Because the management approach is always squeeze that green bit, sweat your labour. Why don't they go for the red bit? Because in our world, that red bit are the triangles. So why don't they go for it? They squeeze the boxes because they can't see the triangles. Another scary one that when I first went on towards going back nearly four years ago is the fact that your band sevens, your ward managers, may have up to 40, maybe 50 staff, 36 bed ward, up to 40 odd patients throughput a day because some are being discharged. And yet the part of the numbers that in a bay of maybe nine beds looking after the patients. How can they possibly know what's going on in the rest of the ward? It's, it's, it's not fair. And I can't think of another industry that would actually tolerate that. Sure, they're given what, a, a day, a fortnight. They call it management time, but it's actually admin. It's, it's not management. I just can't think of another industry that would tolerate that at that unit level. It's so important. 
And then, uh, most worryingly, we've run an exercise with a lot of execs and senior managers. It's a diary exercise. And on almost every occasion, when you look at their real demand, they can't do it all, but if you look at their real demand, it's, it can be in excess of 24 hours a day. And that's real. So if on day one, you only work 12 hours, because you're a slacker, you then, the next day, how many hours worth of work you got to do? Yeah? And if you only work 12 hours because you're slack again, what happens then? You know, again, it's not fair, but this is really worrying. This is the most worrying aspect. I, I hope someone asked me a question on this, Dan. <laughs> but all this stuff that we're trying to do, starting off with the basic stability, the ops management, the real input, forget lean, but the ops management. Who's got time for that when your diary is like that? And, I, I, you know, and that's the thing we're going to have to break because it's not sustainable. So I always come back to the question, who is going to do this? Who's got the time to do it? And I have a feeling that most of you, if you're honest, you're, you know, it's not poor time management. This is from on high. This is the work that it, you should be doing, but you won't get to do it all. So I guess Middleton's biggest problem was medical length of stay. Now, yours could be something different. I, I don't know. But the important thing is, is if you like, understanding what is, what is your, your vital problem. What's your biggest problem? Why wouldn't you only just work on that for now if it's impacting all the other big problems? Understand your deep causes, what is causing this big, big problem. And then challenge the existing paradigms, as these folks have been doing. Challenge the mental models. So come up with your own countermeasures, if you like, so your best bets. An experiment to see if your best bets are working. But a cautionary note before I go. It's all well and good running experiments, but you need a solid bedrock to run these experiments on. If you run an experiment on quicksand, you don't know if it's successful, and it's probably actually dangerous. So it goes all the way back to Ken's, speak earlier, talk rather, earlier on today is you need that basic ops management and stability. Stability is key before you move on to anything else. But that's the next book, Dan. Thank you.